Great. So this is a, uh, about a third of this deck is new for me, so forgive me if I don't know where we're going. Um, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Nils knows that I, I love working without a net in the circus sense. Okay, so um, here's me. Uh, that's the book we're going to give away. Uh, I've been doing product management since before the discovery of electricity. So um, that's about 25 years. Um, the things I worry about the most as an independent consultant, usually coming in as the interim VP of product or coaching the senior folks is, um, have we figured out how to make money? That's important. Have we built a product management and overall team that works together? Does the organization work? And then everything about how the engineering team or the development team went agile and think they know what product management is and gave us all their product owner badges and think that if we show up and write stories, we will make money and have organizations. So I spent a lot of time, I was at the, um, the National Agile Conference in DC a couple of weeks ago, once again giving the talk on why product managers may not be identical to how the Scrum folks defined product owners. And you know, so who in the room is a product manager? Right, we know this. Okay, good. Um, uh, there's the book and, and uh, right, whatever. We keep going. Right. Uh, we're doing the slow clap. Okay, so here's here's where I want to start. I, I've been I've been sort of scratching my head about the fact that I think there's a couple or four or six uh, laws of gravity for making money in software and software economics, and they should be written down. And they're obvious to everybody that they're obvious to, uh, which mostly doesn't include the folks who run software companies, right? <laughs> and they should be obvious and they're not. So I thought I'd start there. And so so we'll try these out. The first one is. Everything about the software business is about scale, okay? So whatever that first copy costs you, a million bucks, 10 million bucks, 100 million bucks, you don't make any money on the first unit that you build. Where you make money is when you can sell the second, third, fifth, thousandth, ten thousandth with exactly the same bits to more people, okay? That would seem obvious to everybody who builds software. Uh, what, do we, what do we call the business when we're doing this one at a time for customers? Yeah, we call it, you know, um, uh, software for hire or um, consultingware. consultingware, right? Different business, different economics. You measure the business differently. You hire different people. You have different metrics, whatever. Okay, so it should be obvious, right? Second one is, and, and you know this is true, there will never, ever, ever be in the world a company that has as much engineering as is sufficient to build all the hopes and dreams of the founders and CEOs and executives and customers. Right? Can't be done ever, ever, ever. It turns out that as an executive, I can think of things faster than you can build them. Right? Seems obvious, turns out not so much. And so, so I'm almost always talking about the need for ruthless prioritization at every single level because we always seem to have more features and more products we want to build and more product lines we want to build and more companies that we want to create than can ever possibly fit into any size development team. Obvious, I hope. Okay, let's keep going. The third one is, I will claim, you can't outsource your strategy to a spreadsheet, right? Um, you can't outsource your strategy to the weighted shortest job first, okay? You can't outsource your, your strategy to letting your customers vote up what they want you to do, okay? All of the outsourcing of strategy, I think, is a complete failure at the executive level and leads to end of company. Right? We used to call it end of job in the punch card days. Okay, so, um, and the fourth one I think, therefore, out of those, and sort of my central theme is, you gotta segment, and segmenting means finding large groups of people who want the same thing, right? So if we're gonna build it once, because all the money is in the second copy, and we're gonna ro ruthlessly prioritize and not do everything that everybody wants, and we're going to actually make some hard decisions. That means picking some group of people who really want the same stuff. So the art of picking your customers turns out to be at least as important as designing your technology. Right? So um, I'm wearing my product manager hat, but I'm really wearing my product strategy hat because the, gosh, I just got a call from some big customer who wants X. 
Interesting, right? Necessary but not sufficient. Okay, so let's, so let's peel it back a little bit. Here's, here's the big thought for the night, if you haven't seen it before. I will claim, um, having just been coming back from the Agile conference, there's nothing more wasteful in the world than building a beautiful product that nobody buys or nobody uses, right? Almost everything that you see in the scaled Agile frameworks and the division of labor is about efficiency and speed and velocity and quality and it doesn't address the question of whether we're going to sell stuff that people are going to give us money for, right? And that 3% at the beginning where you figure out whether this is a good idea before you build it seems important to me because I've worked on dozens, hundreds of projects where we got to the end, we congratulated ourselves, shipped on time, on budget, on spec, and the silence was deafening. And the resumes came out, <laughs> right? So. Uh, Obvious, right? Okay, let's keep going. So, anybody know this product? <laughs> anybody want to tell me this story? <laughs> What's the biggest, meanest, toughest company in the world that's all over the New York Times this week for making people cry in their cubes, right? Um, brilliant company, done tremendously wonderful com company things. AWS is great and all this stuff, right? Um, they wrote down $86 million worth of inventory last October, I think, right? They had warehouses full of this phone and the silence was deafening, right? And I don't know where they went off track, but at some point they lost touch with why people would want to buy this phone, and they focused on why they wanted to sell this phone, right? Different things, right? There's sales, there's marketing, there's product management. Okay, so let's keep going. So, and everybody has a copy of this book. Anybody not have a copy of this book? Shame on you, go buy one, right? Um, the, the takeaways, of course, before we get into the portfolio stuff is, I really, really believe that users understand the problems they want solved. And the misreading of all the history that says customers don't know what problems they have is just a misreading. Okay? Now what they don't know how to do is solve their own problems. And if you outsource to your customers the solution architecture for what you should build, you deserve everything you get because most of your customers are not system architects. And the ones who are do it too complicatedly, right? Um, so we have to make sure before we get too much further down the line that we've asked enough people and we've asked the right people, right? And that we aren't lying to ourselves, right? Because we really want to build something that's not just beautiful and well designed. So thanks for the folks here who are hosting who do well designed stuff, but it would be nice if somebody wanted it too, right? So, um, and, and the last point here. Because, 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 as soon as we put a development team on something at any company of any size, right, it has its own momentum, right? Um, anybody know what a development team of 12 costs per year in the Bay Area? <laughs> two to two and a half million dollars. Okay, so if I put a team of, let's say, nine people, right, you know, four, four or six developers, coders, testers, uh, a UX, UI person, right, whatever. I put a team of nine together. I'm running up close to two million bucks a year. It's really hard to stand up and say six months later, just kidding, right? Pivots are really expensive. Boards of directors are not excited. So as soon as you put a development team on something, it would be nice if you were mostly directionally right because the small pivots are easy, the big pivots are hard. Right? So the month you spend, the extra months you spend in validation before you put a whole team on there is really worth it. Right? Again, completely obvious on inspection, but we have, I, I spend my time with companies almost every day where it's really urgent that we start coding because otherwise we won't get to market so soon. Right? The equivalent is we can't stop for gas or we'll be late for the party. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Once you start spending the big money, everybody's committed and the, and the changes are hard and the investors are not excited, right? Okay, so let's keep going. So what does that have to do with portfolio and product strategy? Almost everything we were talking about was really individual feature or individual product level. So I think of almost all the lean startup work as one feature, one product, one team, one good idea. And we're trying to find, we're trying to go from we don't have a market validated idea do we have one market validated idea and we're going for it, right? The portfolio problem is, well, we have products in the market. <laughs> we have other smart people bringing us really good other smart things and it's no longer sufficient to say we're either pursuing an idea or we're not. What we're now doing is we're pursuing the trade-off between 
the really good idea we signed up for last quarter and last year and the six new ideas which came in today. Right? So portfolio is about making choices not between go and no go, but between putting more into the thing we're pretty sure is good and putting some into the thing we hope for the future. Right? That's the portfolio problem. So um, I'm going to claim that, of course, validation and strategy should happen first. And I put should in parentheses because you know, it just doesn't always happen that way. Uh, the second thing I'll, I'll dive into is the organizational politics of your executive team really, really, really shapes this stuff. If you think that they are objective, logical, aligned, and only looking out for the best interests of the company as a whole, I'd sure like to meet them. <laughs> Right? That would be unusual, right? We'll see there's some structural issues in almost every company that cause folks to have different points of view, different objectives, different timelines. We pay them for it. Okay, so, and so the last thing is, you know, I observe again that it's really good to apply the basic straightforward lean stuff to features, A-B testing, to new products, to new concepts. But we need something bigger than that when we're fighting among folks who all have good ideas, which are hard to quantify. Go. I'd also say that difference of opinion is not only within your own company, but also within your prospective customers. Indeed, indeed. So some of the project sponsors might have, let's say, ego issues. Sure. Whereas the main consumers that you would be delivering to, they've got a different set of opinions that don't necessarily align right. with those I agree, absolutely agree. And, and, and one other thing that I see a lot of here is that we're actually looking at what turns out to be two close segments that are not the same. And so we've got a bunch of customers in one group and a bunch of customers in another group. We can either, well, what are the choices? Build for group one and succeed with group one and leave the other stuff on the floor. Build for group two and succeed with group two and leave the other stuff on the floor. Or build this weird Frankenstein hybrid which makes no sense and doesn't satisfy anybody and get out the resumes, right? The, the segmentation problem of are these customers wanting the same thing is really hard, especially if you don't have much data, especially if you haven't talked to a lot of customers. And it's, I see it as, as, a, as a death spiral with companies that haven't touched enough people to be able to identify an outlier. What would you say is the overlap that falls into that, ignore group two and focus on group one? Um, I don't know, 80%, right? So um, th there's, there's some place where you have to look at it and you say, they're asking for a bunch of features which make no sense over here, but I understand why they want them. And one of those groups is either bigger or has more money or is better aligned with us or we understand them and we have to make a choice. Because if we try to do all things for all people, we end up in you know, the consulting business and everybody gets their own. And that's back to our laws of physics. That's a great business, but it's not the software business. right? That's the renting engineer's business. Yeah. OK, so is this all obvious? I'm hoping it's all obvious, right? Um, you guys know what this is, right? What venture capitalists do with their pen when they want you to get to the interesting part of your pitch? OK, <laughs> so um, out of my own data, unscientifically, here's what I would claim. If I look at the reasons that startups fail and early customers fail and products fail, I'm going to tell you that about a third of them are because, in fact, we're building something that folks don't really want or don't want to pay for or doesn't solve a real problem. So it was a good idea. Thanks for playing. Right? And I'd put the next slice into, it really is a good idea, but we're having trouble either describing it or positioning it or figuring out how to tell the story. Right? It, our engineering team knows why it's great, but we're having trouble explaining to real humans who are going to buy this thing, who aren't engineers, why they want it, why it competes, why it's going to deliver value. Okay? And, and notice that's carefully designed to be half the problem here. If we don't have something that really solves a problem and be able to explain it, we're DOA. Right? Um, and I see the next big slice as it's actually a good idea and we can explain it, but we haven't figured out how to sell it, market it, promote it, get it out to the people who have money or needs or attention for it. And so it sits on our server somewhere, right? sits in the cloud, waiting for the phone to ring. Right? The, the little slices, are we late? Sometimes happens. Is the quality poor? Sometimes happens. Notice that these are the narrow definition of agile problem. Not the big whole scope, but if what you're talking about is efficiency and quality and velocity, you're in these two slices. 
Go. So I don't have a question about the late delivery. I think it's a great chart, by the way. Um, but late delivery, does that usually cause a real failure or is that perceived as a failure? So I think people get fired for it. But I, I think if you've got products that are really solving a problem in the market and you're reasonably somewhat on time and you've ordered the features in a way that the most valuable ones happen first, right? Then a little bit late is a whole lot less bad than can't describe what it's for or don't know how to sell it, right? Exactly. It's, it's the least worst problem. It's the least worst problem, right? Sure, we ship products with bad quality, so does Microsoft, right? Somehow they're still big and making money, unfortunately, right? Whatever. Um, so the point here is that most of this slice of pie is not something that your engineering team can fix by doing better coding, right? Is this obvious? Not to most execs. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, so here's my, here's my other point. I will claim, on no evidence except my own, that bef before we write our first line of code, before we take our first story card out, before we organize our scrum teams, right? Um, if we're building something the world doesn't want, or we can't describe it, or we don't know how we're going to sell it, the engineering team can't dig us out of that, right? So no matter how good we put our engineering team together, um, they aren't solving all problems, they're solving the engineering problems. And, and as a product manager, it falls on me to say, gee, I don't want to spend two million bucks a quarter building something if I don't know how we're going to turn it into money, right? Again, obvious. Let's keep going. All right, so here's the, here's the last fallacy, and, and, and I bring this back with love from uh, the Agile 2015 event, which is, as Agilists, we all know that it's hard to estimate the work to do a piece of technology, right? And we've spent the last decade or two trying to educate the business side, whatever we call it, that they can't expect perfect estimates for technology work because it just can't be done, right? Yet, if you talk to the folks on the engineering side, on the IT side, on the development side, we have this mystical fake belief that the business value that somebody writes on some piece of paper is accurate and can be computed to two decimal places, right? And therefore, we're going to go back to our spreadsheet for a second, and therefore, once we get sizing for the work, we can actually let a spreadsheet decide which things are going to be most valuable because we're just going to take the cross product of value divided by time. I read an article a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago, from Harvard Business Review, and the, the idea was that the term strategic planning was an oxymoron. Maybe. Uh, stra strategy is really about getting the data you can, drawing the conclusions you can draw, but ultimately taking an educated bet. Right. I think that's true. My experience is that ultimately somebody has to stand up, and, uh, and sometimes it's me, and say, I'm uncertain, but I'm willing to bet my job and the company's revenue because it's uncertain. And that's, that's right. Paid. And if it's in Harvard Business Review, it must be true. OK. So, <laughs> So let me decompose. I'm just it's not my idea. I understand. Let me decompose this for a little bit because when I say this, there's a lot of folks who spend their lives carrying business value around who get very upset, right? Rightly so. So, so let me decompose it. The first one I'd say is we're going to blend a bunch of things into business value. The first one is revenue estimates, okay? Now, I'm pretty sure that almost no company on the planet can forecast how much money they're bringing in next quarter. <laughs> so I have strong error bars in my head around how much revenue a feature or a product's going to deliver three quarters from now or five quarters from now. Directionally, I believe it. Rank order, maybe I'll believe it. But I sure don't believe the number. But I know that the folks on the business side can't ask for a project until they write a number on the spreadsheet. Yet, when I put my engineering hat on, I really want to believe that it's true because then I can do a bunch of computations, right? So. We know there's future value in features and products, but they're hard to do. The second one is operational savings. So this is where we say, if you build us this tool for our consulting force, we'll be able to bid smarter contracts and we'll make 10% more margin next year. Or you know, we can make the factory run more efficient if you build us this ERP thing. Certainly true, certainly there. Do I believe the numbers? more than I believe the revenue numbers, but not so much. Okay, let's keep going. Anybody know about future development efficiencies, the thing we call technical debt, okay? Why do we, okay, so here's, here's the giveaway. Anybody can tell me why we actually retire technical debt? Because it's too much hassle. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's the engineering answer, right? Because we can't sell it to business. Okay, well, that's why we don't retire it. <laughs> 
right? We don't retire it because nobody on the business side values it, so we just let it pile up. So why should we actually retire it? Uh, keep people from complaining. Keep people from complaining. That's probably why we do it, right? But, but the economic reason, right? If, if you say, why should we do it? It's because, w go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, but there's this mountain of technical debt, and honestly, as a product manager, I don't care. Unless, 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 go. The next thing you do will be faster. That's it. So pass the book back, right? So the, the promise, the, the contract we make with our engineering team, the promise from them is they should say to us, if you let us clean up this pile of technical debt, the other things we do later will happen faster. And I buy it completely. And then I ask them, how much faster will it be? <laughs> I know I have to invest in it, but I really can't estimate it. Let's keep going, right? We, we will be able to do it, and if we don't address Sure, right. But, but when we return the thing to them and say, well, give us a business value, we know that it's completely, well, whatever it is. Okay, so keep going. Um, quality. We know we have to have quality in our product, but when we do this thing, what we do is we assign every bit of quality work some points as if it's this linear scale and more quality is better, right? It turns out in the market, you're either good enough and you can sell it, or you're not good enough and end a job. And so there's some crossover point here where you've done enough quality and the other quality stuff is probably over-invested, right? And you have to find that qualitative place because the competitors otherwise will eat you alive. But giving a story point to every bug we fix doesn't work. Okay, let's keep going. Um, everybody in engineering knows that buyers are simplistic and they make decisions in some organized way and they take your data sheet and they compare it to the other guy's data sheet and they buy the product that has the better data sheet, right? It's because they never bought it. It's because they never bought or sold anything, right? So, so on the engineering side, we have this belief about rational customers doing very intensive research when in fact our sales rep was in the same fraternity as the guy who's buying it in the committee and that's why he bought it, right? Uh, Politicking, yeah, we have politicking. The point of all this is we as product managers or we as executives are allocating the most precious commodity in the entire universe, which is developer, developer time, right? So we have the smartest developers. How do I know that? That's right, that's exactly it. I asked them. <laughs> so I have the smartest developers on the planet, and the thing I have to not do is waste their time or have them work on stupid stuff, right? My and so. Here. Good, right. So we're allocating the scarcest resource in the entire planet, which is the limited resources, because remember, we don't have enough, right? And so someone, and here's where you stand up on the chair and say, I'm willing to be fired, but somebody has to make a choice, and the spreadsheet's not sufficient, because we're forecasting revenue, and we're forecasting um, technical debt use, and we're forecasting what the competitors are going to do, and somebody has to make a choice, right? Fire when ready, the target's here, right? And that person generally we call, uh, yeah, or former employee, <laughs> 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 right? Uh, good. And, and, and so, so when I look at the, the product problem and the portfolio problem, what I see is that the, the continued requirement for those of us who sit in the hot seat to stand up and say there are hard decisions to make and we're gonna look at a way to make them in a minute, and they won't be perfect, with insufficient information, with forecasts of the future, with uncertain value and uncertain engineering sizing. But you know what? We've got to do it anyway, right? And that the, the idea that we can compute that, uh, I have yet to find that working. OK, we ready to hit the hard stuff? All right, let's keep going. Go ahead, are Nelson. You, are you against analytics altogether? No, I, I love analytics. I, I love analytics. I think we should be as analytical as possible. What we shouldn't do is we shouldn't believe our analytics to the place where we simply go into the meeting and say, this one scored higher than the other one, right? I, I believe in it. So here's my use of analytics. Um, we're going to be able to get four features shipped in the next two quarters. I want to use the analytics to find the top eight. And then I want to close the door and we're going to have a fist fight for a couple of days, right? Because some of them are long term and some of them are short term and right, all the issues. I want to use the analytics as a first pass in the same way if I'm interviewing for, as I am this week, I'm helping a client of mine to interview for product managers. I use the resumes as a first cut, but I would never hire anybody off a resume, right? We got to get him in there. We got to find out who's good, right? 
Okay, let's keep going. So let's talk about doing, um, and let's talk about portfolio planning. This is going to sound easy because it is. Actually, it's not easy. All right, so I'm going to claim that portfolio planning is just like household budgeting. Okay, who in the room actually has a household budget and uses it every month? That's what I figured. Okay, so you guys are just like executives at every software company, right? You talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> okay, so. The point here is we got limited development resources, which is just like your household budget. And just like your household, we got too many things to spend it on and no real controls, right? Um, as, as the parent of somebody who used to be a teenager and who would come home and say, my favorite band is coming to town and, I, and my girlfriends and I want to go see it and they're only $275 a ticket, right? We didn't have a line item for that. And then we had to make a decision about what we were not going to spend money on, right? Girl Scout cookies, college fund, right? We're putting it in a lot of buckets and it's hard to do. Um, okay, and, 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 the most important thing, right? <laughs> Is this true? Okay, um, at every meeting, your execs come in with a new idea and it's a great idea and it's a wonderful idea and it's an idea I absolutely support. <laughs> but remember from above, we don't actually have excess resources, right? And in their minds, they've already gotten the other things they've asked for and so they're ready to ask for new things, but we haven't finished them yet. Okay, so uniformly what I find, particularly with execs who come up on the sales and marketing side, as opposed to the engineering side, is there's this mystical belief that there must be white space in the development calendar. And I walked through engineering and I saw that folks weren't typing, so they must not have been working. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yes? Okay, let's keep going. All right, so anybody, everybody know this book? If you don't have this book, go buy this book. This is probably the most important book of the decade. Okay? This is about how people really make decisions. Okay, so Daniel Kahneman, brilliant. Why is, why is this stuff hard at the top? The first is it's really hard to attribute success, particularly in a B2B or enterprise space where there's lots of touch and lots of hands. I think it's less hard in a very high volume consumer thing. If you're doing online auctions, and you can run hundreds of thousands of A-B tests, you can actually attribute success. If you're selling enterprise database licenses for $300,000 to investment banks, not so much, okay? Oh, quick quiz. Uh, Nils, you're not allowed to answer. Okay, um, for those of you here who are at companies that are, have enterprise sales forces, anybody? Okay, so here's the question. If I survey your sales force, what's the number one reason we closed big deals this quarter? Personal relationships. Close. A certain feature or a feature list. Not at all. Uh, reputation. Right, no. No. The number one reason we closed deals this quarter was. We've been working on them for the past six quarters. Go ahead, Nils. Awesome because I am a great sales rep. Okay. <laughs> Ask your sales reps. It's true. Sorry. It's the same story. It is, it is actually. So the point here is, if you ask your sales reps why we won the deal, the answer is they're great sales reps. If you ask them why they lost the deal, why are the two reasons we lost the deal? Price and features. Price and features, okay? So if you ask your sales force to justify the success and failure, you'll find out you have great salespeople and that you need thousands more features at lower prices, okay? Very useful, okay, good. Second is, that's right, I can sell it if I can, well, we need to raise the price. give away that book and then he didn't. I didn't, because nobody gave me the right answer. Okay, so. Um, Fine. <laughs> yes, that's fine. So the second theme is remember we hire sales teams not to sell on behalf of the whole company. We hire them to close individual deals. And we hire persuasive people. We pay them a lot of money. If they don't close deals, what do we do? Fire. We fire them, right? First prize is a Cadillac. Second prize is a set of knives. Third prize is you're fired, okay. So we don't, we don't, we hire salespeople who are very persuasive, who know how to escalate on the customer side to the person who can say yes, who are persistent, who never take no for an answer. And when we as product managers tell them they're not getting that feature, what do they do? They escalate, they find somebody on our side to say yes, they go over our heads, they push, 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 they inflate the size of the deal. They are in the job of getting paid for closing deals, not for the good of the company. And when we go back to segment versus customer, Sales reps are not the people who are going to give you objective points of view. Okay, so next, revenue estimates have huge bars, right? We don't actually know what's going to come in. We take our best guess. Um, and executives don't believe in the exclusive or principle. You guys know about exclusive or if you're engineers, right? One thing, but not the other, right? Um, 
there must be room for this one little thing. It's probably only 10 lines of code, right? Okay, executives don't actually believe in the exclusive OR principle or the roadmap. You're different, right? Okay, and the shiny objects, confirmation bias, right? This is all about how decisions really get made. And we have to protect ourselves from the fact, not that they're engineers who use spreadsheets, but that they're executives who use strategy maps. Okay, politics. You guys know about big swing budgets? It's related to other kinds of anatomy. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a bigger budget. I must be right. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's talk about some strategy here then, um, which is, so what do we do in the face of a different kind of rationality than the engineering team wants? The engineering team wants spreadsheets, perfect forecasts of revenue, right? Um, rational people who never change their mind and who understand the limits of resources. What a great company. Okay, so let's, let's turn the problem a little bit and say, well, how do we put some guardrails up so we can actually make decisions? And I, what I'd say is it's really hard to sort unlike things. When you're trading off the next feature versus the next quality thing versus the next tech debt versus the next investment in the future versus the one-off crazy thing the sales guys brought in, those are really hard trade-offs to make, especially on the margin and especially with no planning or preparation, right? You're basically stuck and you end up going with the sales rep because he's more persuasive because that's why you hired him, right? So I'm going to suggest what we do is we create groups of stuff, we create categories of stuff, and then we decide how much we can spend on the category. So we say, we're only going to have 410 story points this quarter or whatever your unit is for features. So which features are we going to take that don't exceed our feature budget and we have to have the features battle against each other on an equal basis for either revenue or retaining revenue or keeping customers happy, right? Separate from which P1 and P2 bugs are we going to fix? There's some budget for fixing stuff and there's some amount of money a little bit for the big wild crazy thing, right? Um, some of you might know I wrote an MRD in 1996 for teleportation that included pricing and competitive analysis. <laughs> and my team is still working on it, right? Uh, but if we're doing that, we can't also do the other really wild, crazy thing, right? What's the budget, right? And, and the cross-bucket trade-offs, because all of the folks on the numerical spreadsheets, the answer side will say, oh, all you need to do is create the conversion number because one point of quality is worth two and a half dollars worth of revenue is worth 3% of a future thing. And those are all fictitious and those are all reflecting our biases about how we'd like the answers to come out because when they're wrong, we simply fix the ratios until they come out right, don't we? Okay, that's how we know they're right, because they feel good. Okay, so, uh, oh, by the way, these are two executives doing this process, okay? <laughs> so we, we had to put them in buckets. Here they are putting them in buckets. Um, I had a short consulting assignment with this company. Anyway, all right, so let's, let's uh, look at the problem. If I look at a typical software company budget, and here I'm using the word budget to mean how did we spend our valuable engineering resources last quarter? If we put them into segments, and we counted them up historically. What did we spend it on? Depends on the company. Right? I'll tell you that for enterprise companies, you're spending about 20% of your points on something you didn't plan on at the beginning of the quarter, whether it came from a sales rep or whatever, right? Random stuff came in for good or bad, and you spent 20% of your budget on things you didn't plan on, which, by the way, probably explains why 20% of the things you planned on didn't get done. Right? And you're going to spend about, let's say, half of it on actual features for the current release, which is good. You're going to have some amount on quality and test. If you're folding test into there, you know, you get different slices, but let's say this is all the refactoring stuff. There's some engineering overhead, which we never, ever, ever, ever tell our executives about because they'll tell you what kind of That's it. Right. So the answer is, if we tell our executives that there's overhead in engineering that we spend time on, they will say, Let's do that next quarter, right? Um, exactly cool. Does anybody uh, know the proof that joining a gym has no health benefits? Okay? <laughs> you actually have to go, okay? And the reason, the reason gyms make money, at least in the U.S., is because everybody joins and they never go, right? It turns out that that's the exact same thing as saying we're going to invest in quality or futures or architecture next quarter, but this quarter it's really important Right? You never get there. Go. Uh, the sales one-offs. Th those are probably of all the things that I have done in my career, those are the, the most frustrating things. 
And yet, sometimes some really good reasons are. Do you, sure. Could you give some guidance? How do you how do you how do you draw the line? Yeah. Let's let's hold that for a second. Come back to it because yeah, most of those are crap, but some of them are great. And part of this is your judgment because we pay you to have judgment, and part of it is your good relationships with the senior salespeople to figure out who on their team is telling you the truth, and part of it is doing a lot of digging. Let's come back to it. Okay, so, but the point here is if we set up a budget and we said we're spending 15% of our story points on quality, I can now go to my head of quality or anybody else and say, spend it any way you want. Choose wisely, right? I'm not so smart about this stuff. Pick some things that need fixing and spend your budget and let's make it better, right? And everybody's happy because it got off of my plate and we did the right things, right? Um, that one at the top generally is about discipline at the executive level. We'll come back to it. Okay, so um, of course this varies with, with stage. So if we looked at a very early stage V1.0 software company, um, notice there's no slice that says invest in the future. <laughs> If we're not shipping and making money, then we're all out of a job anyway, so we better get 1.0, right? Um, some quality, some release. I have a bigger slice for one-offs mostly because we don't actually know what our customers want. And so these are probably going to be higher quality interrupts from people who know what they're trying to do because we didn't get it right. Okay, if you look at somebody in very, very late stage, and I won't say the name of the company, but I'm thinking of a big company that buys lots of old software companies and milks the products until they're dead and I won't say their name, um, what you'll see in the very late stage post-innovation companies is they got some features. They are investing a lot more in quality because mostly they're old things that were not well maintained and they're on platforms that don't exist anymore. Right? Or you can't get parts, you can't get software. There's a lot of engineering overhead because there is. Um, and future bets are small and by the way, they're acquisitions. Right? Nobody's building anything new there. What they're trying to do is extract the most money for the least engineering out of those products and then letting them die, right? So a strategy here, because that's a strategy, is a good one if it makes sense, right? Different strategies, but it requires that we make a choice and say, we know where we are, we know what stage we're at, we know what's good for our company. We happen to be in a place where there's a tremendous competition for quality. We're making medical instruments and people will die, right? We need more spending on quality. Or we're in a feature war right now and we're gonna, we're gonna intentionally mortgage the future to win the current feature war, but we're really uncomfortable and we're gonna try to reset that in two quarters because otherwise we know we're out of business, right? This is a discussion. This is a map to say, what the heck are we doing? What's our current spend, right? Because until we know how we're spending, we can't do it differently. And maybe it's right, maybe it's not, but we get to ask, at the end of the quarter, did that feel good? How do we shift money? Because pie charts have the feature, by the way, that when you add to one slice, you have to take away from another slice. Right? So they're much better for the executive audience than the stacked bar charts, where you can just make the bar charts higher. OK? Good. Let's keep going. OK, so, um, so product level, we have to make choices. We have to make choices um, working with a group where they had five big initiatives for the quarter, right? They needed to improve uh, deployability, they needed to reduce costs, they needed to improve scalability, they had a hardware issue, they had like six initiatives. And the answer was they couldn't make progress on six initiatives, right? Grow up. So we picked two. Now, better if we choose wisely, but at least we pick two, right? And we make our chart at the beginning of the quarter and we say we're going to spend most of our money on making these products finally deployable. And now we can give the engineering and the product teams resources and say, find the best ways to make these deployable. Right? Or if that's not it, let's choose scaling. Let's spend 60% on scaling and free up the teams to actually make progress instead of death by a thousand purchase orders, whatever it is. Right? Okay, so that's the point. We, we, we make product level choices so that we can let the team do their work. OK, let's keep going. Um, and then you get to ask the question, which is, so how did we actually spend money last quarter? Because now we're back to, we had a plan, but Goldman Sachs called up and said they were going to give us $50 million if we completely threw our release under the bus. And then that deal didn't show up. OK, so, um, and what was unplanned? So unplanned is the part that comes from the execs, whatever comes from God. OK, let's keep going. Uh, you guys know about this? And, and, 
It's the wrong language, I apologize. Um, it's Swedish. Um, this is the BCG, this is the Swedish version of the BCG chart, right? So this is the Casa Cor, these are the uh, milk cows, right? You guys don't know this? Okay, so you got, you know, you got cash cows, you got the dogs, the hundar, right? You got the stars and you, and you got the question marks. I, I was tired of looking at it in English, right? So portfolio is all about making choices between products and between product lines. Go ahead. Oh, so this is uh, Till Vagsengrad. <laughs> so this is um, gro uh, speed of growth of the market, right? And this is our relative market position. So if it's a slow moving market, but we have the good position, we make a lot of money and we shouldn't invest so much. If it's a slow moving market and we have not much market share, we have to spend just as much engineering as everybody else to stay even, but we never catch up, right? The stars are the ones where we have the dominant share in a growing market, and the ones up here, we don't know yet, right? It's, it's a risk. And so the portfolio says you better have a few of these because that's how you invest. You're hoping for these, you want a few of these because this is what funds everything else. And unless there's a reason to keep these, you might let them go, right? Now, that assumes a company with multiple products, probably with multiple business units, right? This is a big company problem, right? But when you have a portfolio, big company problem, and you get to name your animals here, right? Um, all right, so you get things like, how many products or projects can we fund? Because if we fund more than that, what happens? Not much, right? We have 57 projects, each of which is half funded and none of them ship, right? So we must make choices that say we can't fund everything. Um, somebody's got a really big idea that's gonna require us to form a whole new business unit, new marketing, new sales, new channels, new engineering, new product management. What does that mean? Unless we have infinite resources and investors with lots of money, some other business unit's about to lose those same people. Right? So we make a choice. We don't simply create new business units. Right? Um, you guys know about the Jeffrey Moore, Horizon 1, 2, 3 thing, right? Horizon 1 is things that are paying us money now. Horizon 2 is products that are soon to return some money and we've got to invest. And Horizon 3 is stuff that's far away, which if we don't invest, we're out of business in five years. We've got to allocate some money to the future or, right, um, in the long term, we're all dead, right? Who was that? I've heard that 50% of your revenues this year come from products introduced in the last two. Uh, yeah, it depends on your industry. Good. A cross-platform, if, if we don't invest in platforms, then we never have platforms. And no business unit ever wants to invest in platforms if they can make somebody else do the work, right? Um, uh, and sometimes you have customers that buy all your products and you got to think about them in a whole because maybe the product doesn't make money, but it supports something else, right? So hard problems, multi-dimensional problems, not solved by a spreadsheet. You can simply let your business unit VPs duke it out, right? Biggest budget, best line to the CEO, whatever, or you can have a plan, right? Okay, so, and the yardstick, by the way, here. So I, I have a long post about this, but I will claim that if you're in the software business and you're no longer a startup, you're into revenue, um, you need to have a million dollars a year coming in for every person on your development team. Okay, so if you have a development team of 12, devs, tests, docs, DevOps, whatever they are, you got 12 people on your team, including yourself, and you don't have a $12 million prediction for that, uh, your company is supporting you on the promise of future revenue. Because big companies are bringing in a million bucks per head on the development side. So if you have a really, really smart idea that takes 25 engineers, and you think it's a $10 million idea, um, sell it to somebody else. Um, the, the metric here is important, not when you're at a startup because you never know, but as you get big, the way companies get valued is, turns out to be, uh, revenue as a function of R&D, right? So if you can't, as a product manager, when you go into your boss and say, I need nine more developers or development team for my stuff, you're making a promise, whether you know it or not, that in the next year or two, you've added another $9 million to the bottom line, to the top line revenue, okay? And if you don't know that, somebody in finance will eventually help you understand it, and then you fall into the ex-employee category. Okay, so, um, so here's my takeaways, because I expect we're out of time, right? Um, 
Again, I think you can't outsource strategy. I think folks who do bottom-up strategy, which means we simply let everybody vote or the best little bits come up from the bottom, end up with co incoherent products, right? They end up with random, uncurated, weird stuff that doesn't answer any particular need, right? You can't just, you need bottom-up is good, top-down is required, and as you get past version one, this gets harder to do because it's harder to figure out who it's buying. Okay, next one. Um, yeah, validation before development. This is again obvious, yet everybody's not doing it. Before you put the big development team on, hint, 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 make sure it's a decently good idea that's directionally correct. Okay, um, product level, portfolio level allocations, that's the pie charts, right? Make some choices before the meeting with the salespeople. So uh, a short answer here, I had a great VP of sales at a company I was at about a decade ago called Air Magnet. His name's Stuart. I think he's terrific. And we, we made the following arrangement. Um, I gave him a magic bullet that was worth one week of engineering every quarter. And he could use it on anything he wanted that fit into one week of engineering. Why did I do this? It had a really cool side effect. And the side effect was whenever one of his sales reps came to me and said, what do they always say? I need you to do this, it's really urgent, it's really important, it can't be very hard. I got to say, well, you know, Stuart has the magic bullet and if he thinks this is worth it and there's real revenue, because he's a sales guy and he can see the lips moving, right? Um, then we'll do it, right? And if not, not my problem, right? I outsourced to Stuart the problem of which of his sales reps really had deals that could close with one more small feature. And if he chose wisely, he made a lot more money that quarter. I actually did something similar where when I was managing engineering, I would always tell the salesperson rather than no, if you can get your VP to fund two contractors for me, I can do it. And they would never come up with the right. you know, thirty or forty thousand Indeed. dollars. Indeed. Right. Except one time I got yelled at for it by my VP. But but it almost always put right. people right. away. Uh, the, another choice is to say, well, I'd love to move that to the top of the list. You're going to help me make the phone calls to the 25 customers that we promised the release to, yeah. who are worth 80 times as much revenue as this deal. Okay, last one. Um, you still have to have a great development team, right? Agile is important. DevOps is important. Velocity is important. Building great architected software is important. If you can't do it, you can't ship, you're out of business. It doesn't matter what your strategy is. So we can't kick our engineering brethren under the bus here. We need them. They're smarter than us, and they're better than us, and they're better paid than us. But we have to have them work on the right stuff. And, and we can't let them be in a position where random people are pulling them in random directions and wasting their time, because that ends up nowhere. OK, so that's the, I think that's the end. That's the takeaways, by the way. So you know this is a takeaway container. Anybody who missed it? OK, so um, last thought. Here's how to find me, OK? Um, we have one of these left to give away. Uh, and again, anybody who knows the answer isn't allowed. To, uh, so uh, how is it that you can get your own name as your domain name? Notice that my last name and my domain name are the same. Not so easy to do. How do you do that? I, I wanted to give it's, this away. It's an unusual name, so you were able to pay a fairly low price. Yeah, good, good answer. Not the right one. <laughs> OK. Um, Anyway, so, so the, the answer is if you buy your, your last name as a domain name in 1995 when nobody's buying domain names, it's really easy and cheap. Um, but uh, I'll post the slides. You got, you'll get the video. Um, anybody who didn't get a book and wanted a book and drops me an email and specifies whether they want the Kindle or the iOS or the PDF versions, because in this market, of course, it's not allowable for one vendor to use the same file format as another major vendor. Um, I'll send you the book. OK, questions? Do we have time for questions? Or are we out? Can we do the website? Yeah, I'll post them. Yeah. And we'll do questions uh, After. afterwards. OK, good. So, okay. Done. Thank you so much, Rich. Thank you.